Hey everybody, this is Dan from Pain Free You. I have the pleasure today of introducing Alexandra Ocampo from Miami. And uh, she was gracious enough to volunteer to do a success story for us and share her journey with you. So thank you, Alexandra, I really appreciate you. Thank so, you. Yeah, if you would, why don't you bring us on a journey and a little bit of the formula is what started happening symptom wise? What did you do medically? What that journey was like? And we don't have to get into, I did this appointment and that treatment, and it, but just an overview. Um, when did you find out about the mind-body concept? And uh, how did that help? Um, was there anything in particular you started to do that was really the turning point for you that really made a difference where you're at today? And kind of tell me your journey. Tell me your story. So I appreciate Perfect. you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and, you know, for providing this platform for us, you know, to share our stories. Um, right. I hope that this could help others that are struggling, you know, just like I was. Um, I'm truly, truly grateful uh, for all your videos. They really were a game changer for me in my journey and um, I'm sure in many others as well. Um, so before I go into the pain story, I did want to quickly like mention that I've been a pretty anxious person since I was a child. Okay. Um, my mom was always very like over or overly protective. Um, she would take me to the doctor for like any minimal thing I would feel, um, whether it was a cold or like stomach pain, she was always the first one to like run to the doctor. Um, and a, a day I remember pretty vividly was when, um, I was 10 years old, uh, where I came home from school complaining about my stomach and, you know, my mom took me to the pediatrician and the doctor told me I sh should go to the ER so they could run more tests on me. So, um, we went and, you know, they basically couldn't find anything, but, um, I remember the doctor telling me it was like best that they take my appendix out because there was a possibility that wow. I could have, um, appendicitis. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I remember just being so scared that day. Um, I still have that image of, you know, the doctors wheeling me into the operating room oh, wow. while I was trying to hold on to my mom, <laughs> you know, just thinking, um, just thinking of it was like a little traumatizing, you know, like for a kid um, who was, was so attached to her mom. And, you know, I, I think that's a lot of where my health anxiety and my anxiety in general ha came from, because there's been other incidents too. But yeah, anyway, um, I just remember. That's understandable. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> totally understandable. Yeah. So anyway, um, just I remember having a lot of stomach issues throughout my adolescence, you know, whether it was nausea, bloating, vomiting, pain. It was always something with my stomach. And even around 20 years old, I, I had my gallbladder taken out. Um, at the time, you know, I, I never thought anything of it. I, I just thought my stomach issues were like genetic or you know, I thought I was born that way, but now like years later, especially after learning about all this and um, is when I realized that, you know, I had all these characteristics of a, a TMS or that's probably why I had all these gastro issues. Um, anyway, fast forward to my freshman year in college. Uh, I remember having days where, you know, I be began feeling like a little off. Um, I remember having weird episodes of like feeling dizzy and weak, you know, my arms felt like they weren't attached to my body. Um, my heart was racing and, you know, I just felt like I was going to pass out. Okay. Um, I remember having a couple of incidents like that, you know, I, I had no idea what it was, but, you know, I, I was sure that something was wrong with me. Um, and of course I went to the doctor and I got every test done in the book. You know, I got my thyroid checked, um, uh, my sugar levels, everything, you name it. Right. Um, but you know, they never found anything. Um, and even with everything coming up normal, I always thought that there was something missing or, you know, that I wasn't, um, and I wasn't going to stop searching until they would find out, <laughs> find out what was wrong with me. <laughs> so, um, I went to naturopaths, endocrinologists, functional medicine doctors, you name it. And none of them could uh, give me a definite diagnosis. Um, I had a cabinet full of supplements and like essential oils that uh, were supposed to help, but you know, nothing really worked. Right. Um, the symptoms would just keep coming back. 
So um, in the middle of all that, I still managed to graduate college, you know, with my associate's degree. Um, but when I transferred to un university, that's when things started to get worse. Okay. Um, you know, that feeling of feeling dizzy was there now 24 seven. Um, as soon as I would wake up in the morning, I would feel like I was on a rocking boat. Wow. Okay. And yeah, um, I would never feel steady in my body. Um, it was honestly one of the scariest feelings I've ever had. Um, you know, just lots of brain fog, confusion. I would forget things a lot. And, um, you know, that feeling of just being dizzy all the time, all the time. Um, at the time, you know, I was still living with my parents. Um, they were obviously very concerned about seeing me like this. So, you know, they started taking me to all these specialists. Um, I went to like about three different ENTs. Um, one of them told me I had Meniere's disease, which is when you have like fluid buildup in your inner ear and you get vertigo because of it. Um, another one told me I had BPPV, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, um, which is another inner ear problem where like the crystals in your ear uh, get misplaced um, and cause you to feel dizzy. So they referred me to vestibular rehab, which is like physical therapy for people with vertigo, where, you know, where they put you in all these different positions to like put yeah, your crystals back to place. And all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they told me I had to sleep sitting upright the entire time and that, you know, I, I couldn't go to the salon or get my hair done because it could move the crystals around and make things worse. Wow. Um, so imagine, you know, how scared I was, you know, trying not to make any head movements. Sure. Um, I was scared to shower, bend down, you know, scared to go anywhere, do anything really. Um, and I did the therapies for a couple months and, you know, that didn't work. <clears throat> I still continue to feel dizzy all the time. Um, I went back to my ENT and after seeing that none of the treatments worked, um, that's when they referred me to a neuro, uh, autologist, which is like a ENT and a neurologist at the same time. Um, and he was supposed to be one of the top doctors from the university of Miami, you know, like five stars, more than 30 years of experience. So I was feeling very, very desperate and, you know, optimistic to see this guy. Um, so when I finally was able to see him, you know, just by telling him my symptoms, he told me I had something called vestibular migraine, which is basically episodes of vertigo and dizziness with other migraine symptoms like, you know, visual aura, light sensitivity, and the, those kind of symptoms. Okay. Um, he, he also ordered an MRI and a CT scan as well. And, you know, those came back clear. And he basically told me uh, to get on an SSRI medication called uh, amitriptyline. Uh, those medications are usually prescribed for people with depression, but you know he said that they were also going to be effective for this. And he told me that the medication had very strong side effects and to be aware of that. Um, he also gave me a prescription for Valium and basically sent me home and told me that you know vestibular migraine was not curable. I remember those words and that, you know, I would just have to manage this with medication and a low sodium diet for the rest of my life. Wow. Um, yeah. And I, you know, when he told me those words, I, I promise you that I left that office with my dad crying. Um, I had to be 23 years old, you know, so young, just wanting to live a normal life. And it literally felt like it was the end of the world for me because I believed him. And I really believed I was going to be this way for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, Constantly dizzy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, question for you. Was it off balance dizzy or was it like the really harsh vertigo where you're like floored, you can't do anything because the room's spinning? Like how how intense was it? What I'm trying to understand. It was intense, um, but it's not like the room was spinning. It's more like my body was the one moving <laughs> the That's entire fine. time. I'm just curious because I'm sure a lot of the audience will be saying, well, how how bad did she have the spins or did she was she off balance? And I just wanted to clarify, not that it's any less severe or challenging. I just yeah. understand. 
definitely very debilitating as well, um, along with all the other symptoms that come along with that particular right. symptom. Um, but yeah, I um, just, I remember getting home that day after, you know, he told me that and, you know, I started doing what a lot of us TMSers do, <laughs> which is Google searching and um, getting into these vestibular migraine support groups and all I could see was like these negative posts and comments about how miserable people were and how they were living like this for years. Mm -hmm. uh, so that didn't help the situation, obviously. Uh, I eventually unfollowed all those groups, thank God. <laughs> right. um, I don't know where I would be um, if I still were. Smart. But yeah. So all of this while still trying to finish university, I, I you know, I, I didn't stop going. <laughs> My parents. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, my parents had to drive me to school by this point uh, because I couldn't drive myself anymore. I dreaded going to the university because all I could look forward to was, you know, getting into my bed and just laying down and closing my eyes. Um, but anyway, e even with all of it, I managed to graduate with, you know, my bachelor's degree in 2016. Um, and to this day, I really don't know how I did it. I, you know, I think my part of it was my parents, you know, when my husband pushing me every day mm -hmm. um, to go to class and um, just my strong will of not letting these symptoms defeat me. I've been a pretty strong woman <laughs> my entire life. Um, but yeah, so my, my life basically became like feeling like I was in survival mode every day, you know, uh, just pushing through everything. Life never felt very real or like genuine anymore. Um, I didn't feel like I was enjoying anything or I, I just had no feelings. I just survived every day pretty much. Um, I then got married in 2018. And I remember this day being, you know, very stressful for me as well. Um, you know, it's sad to say I can't really say I fully enjoyed my wedding that day like I would have wanted to, but um, yeah, the entire time I was just nervous and the feeling that I was going to pass out and whatever, you know, uh, how that goes. Um, I literally only remember bits and pieces of that day. Um, and then about a year later in 2019, um, I was pregnant, you know, with our first child, my son, and I'm going to make this part short, even though a lot happened, but basically I, I had a very traumatic start to my pregnancy, um, where I was told that one of the prenatal lab tests had come back abnormal. Um, they said our son would come with a syndrome called trisomy 13, which is a rare condition where the baby forms an extra chromosome and that the baby could be born with heart defects, brain abnormalities, things like cleft palate. Um, we were obviously devastated. Um, doctors were telling us that it was best to abort the baby. And, you know, I just, I felt in, into a very deep depression. Um, Thankfully, by the grace of God, after a very invasive uh, second test that I had done, you know, they told us that the first lab test was a false positive and that the baby was completely healthy. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was hard. Okay. By that point, um, the damage was already done. You know, my nervous system was already on high alert and um, I was just, again, surviving every day as best as I could. So everything uh, eventually, I mean, did did go well, and I had a perfectly healthy baby boy. Um, then two years later, I had my second child. Um, I only have two, uh, and then she's a baby girl. And she has quite the story, too, which, again, I, I'm not going to make this long, but it's I think it's important to just briefly uh, mention it just so you'll understand why the symptoms kept lingering on for so long. Right. Um, with my daughter, I was pretty much bed bound the entire pregnancy again with the dizziness 24 seven. Um, I literally did not get up from my bed, you know, only to shower, to eat or use the restroom. <laughs> it was that bad. And it got to that point, um, unfortunately. Um, and it was hard for me because, you know, I, I already had a two year old to take care of and, um, the baby, you know, a, a baby that always wanted to be with his mommy, but, you know, couldn't go out with him to play or do anything fun. Uh, someone always had to be in the house helping me, whether it was my grandma or my dad, because I couldn't physically get up to do anything. Um, and I always felt so guilty for that. So to this day, you know, like I still get very like emotional about it because I, I felt like I failed my son as a mother when I was going through all this and it's just, it was, it was very tough. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but anyway, um, moving on, you know, with Ariana, my daughter, she, she was born at 34 weeks, which is not considered a full-term baby yet. Um, she came early, uh, everything just happened really fast. This was during COVID. Um, and apparently I tested positive. <laughs> I didn't even have any symptoms. Um, and because of this, they, they didn't allow me to hold my daughter for, for 10 days while she was in the NICU you know, connected on a ventilator because she couldn't breathe on her own. Um, and it was just, it was truly an unfortunate experience. Um, my husband was basically the one doing everything for me. And again, those feelings of sadness, guilt, and just, you know, my nervous system being on high alert from all the trauma I was exposed to, or what I feel like the kept like triggering things even more. So wow. um, this, yeah. So this is where things started to get very painful for me. This is where I was introduced to real pain. Um, it started a couple days after my daughter got home from the NICU. Um, I began to feel some discomfort in my pelvic area. Um, at first, I thought it was a UTI or maybe a yeast infection. You know, the common stuff you hear women get sometimes. And um, I noticed it wasn't going away. I, I decided to go to my uh, OBGYN and, you know, he gave me some antifungal medication because, you know, they thought it was a yeast infection. Sure. That didn't work. Um, the pain persisted and it was getting very painful to the point where, you know, I could not sit on my chair or even wear jeans or tights. You know, it would hurt even to use the restroom or, you know, just to be intimate with my husband. And, you know, I had to get myself a cushion just to be able to sit. Um, you know, I was working an office job at this time, which required me to sit for long periods of time as well. So you can imagine how hard that was as well. Um, eventually, I, I went back to the OB and he told me I should go to a pelvic pain specialist where, you know, they could further evaluate me and give me a uh, better di a diagnosis. So I went and, you know, she asked me a couple questions and told me I had something called pelvic health dysfunction and pudendal neuralgia, which I know you've heard of it already before, because I've seen you talk about it in your videos, um, which is basically an irritated or damaged nerve in the pelvic area uh, that's causing like burning, stabbing, shooting pains. It's awful. <laughs> Um, and she said that, you know, this was common for women after giving birth. So I was like, hmm, okay. Um, it just never made sense to me though. Um, I had a C-section for both of my babies. Um, so I didn't even have a vaginal birth. Mm -hmm. So there's no correlation there at all. Um, so then she told me that the treatment plan consisted of lidocaine injections and steroid injections that could possibly help with the pain, but that there was no guarantee that this would, you know, give me immediate relief. Um, it was basically a 50, 50 chance that this would work. Um, and that wasn't very promising, obviously. No. Um, besides that, you know, the insurance didn't cover it, at least my insurance didn't, and um, it was extremely expensive. So <clears throat> honestly, I was just so scared of getting any of those treatments done. So I, I chose a more conservative route um, I decided to see a pelvic physical therapist who said I had, um, hypertonic muscles, which is another term for like tight muscles. Sure. And yeah, she, um, she recommended that I would come in two times a week. Um, and it's pretty invasive as well. Like those sessions for me were very painful and uncomfortable, you know, just for multiple reasons that we all know I of. I imagine. Mm hmm and, um, you know, I also had to do these Valium suppositories, which I had never even heard of. Um, it was awful and embarrassing. And, you know, I just, I, I didn't keep getting better. So um, by this point, I was just hopeless. Um, but I continued to search for answers. And I, I forgot what I searched for on Google one night. I think it was something like along the lines of like pelvic pain success stories um, and that's when Nicole Sachs podcast popped up and really, yeah, this is where I first heard about TMS and I listened to a ton of them. And, you know, one of them that really stood out to me was uh, one from this girl. Um, I think her name is Whitney Reidman. Mm -hmm. 
um, she had pelvic pain herself too. And you know, she described everything I was feeling to a T. Um, so she, you know, she, and she had said that she had healed herself with this work. So that's where my hope and my belief in getting better, like really grew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, before I jump into everything I did for my recovery journey, I did like want to mention that uh, one of my last and like my rock bottom moments that I had with uh, all these symptoms was burning mouth and trigeminal neuralgia as well. Um, and which is basically like facial and burning pain on one side of your like face and mouth. And, you know, I had it mostly like in my tongue and my gums and my throat. And, you know, this this happened in 2022. So like not even too long ago, but, um, but that was really my rock bottom. Um, and I think my body was just like screaming at me for help by this point. And it was like a way for me to just wake up and like, show me that I needed to make some changes in my life and my way of thinking, or I would con continue living this way forever. Um, but anyway, um, after that, I, I downloaded the curable app and, you know, I started learning about how pain works and how, how a lot of these illnesses originate, you know, from the brain. And honestly, when I first heard about all of this, it was really difficult for my brain to accept it. You know, like for most of us, we've always been taught that like there, that there's a medical answer for everything or that if it's physical, then there must be a physical explanation to it. Right. Um, but at this point, you know, I, I had nothing to lose. I, I had no other option and nothing that the doctor was offering me was helping me anyway. So, you know, I, I went all in. Um, I read Alan Gordon's book, Tell Me About Your Pain, which is, you know, I, I feel was very helpful. And um, there's another book called The Universe Has Your Back uh, by right. Gabrielle yeah, Bernstein. Um, and that one really helped me like understand how everything in life just happens for you and, you know, not against you. So all those books helped me along the way. Um, I also came across your YouTube channel <laughs> and, um, you know, I would literally listen to your vid videos on my daily walks every single morning. Um, there, <laughs> I swear, <laughs> I I really did. And um, there was something about your like calm tone of voice um, and like your certainty about this stuff that really, really just got me motivated every day to just keep showing up for myself. So, Beautiful. you know, I, I, I also did try a little bit of journaling and, you know, I'd say that helped a little with, you know, feeling my emotions and like releasing some of that repressed anger and grief I had inside. But I wouldn't say that's what helped me heal all of it. Um, like, yes, I do think it's important to have moments to reflect on the past and maybe heal those parts that we haven't like let go of, but we cannot stay there and, and what I truly, truly feel that really helped me heal was to like, let go of that story I had playing in my head 24 right. seven. Um, I had to force myself to come back into the present moment because I was not living in the present. And um, that's something that Christine really helped me like come into the, re like I realized that, that I was doing that a lot. You know, you think you're living in the present, but you're really ruminating all day, thinking about your pain and how miserable your life is and how, yeah. how you need to take all these steps and uh, to fix it and this and that, but you know, that's not living in the present. So, um, if I can jump in real quick. You just yeah. mentioned Christine. Christine is one of my other success stories. Mm -hmm. and she and Alexandra had connected somehow and become friendly. So I just wanted to point that out for anybody wondering who this Christine was, who was kind of guiding you to stay in the present, um, mm -hmm. the success story. So if you go to pain free you success and look for Christine, that's who Alexandra's referring to. Right. So, I mean, basically I, I had to bring myself back. Um, every time I'd catch myself thinking about the pain and instead do something I actually enjoyed doing, like whether it was Something as simple as going to get my nails done, uh, going to the gym, exercising, walking, cooking, listening to music, dancing, going out with family. Even if I didn't want to, I still did it anyway. Right. And, you know, by by all means, I'm not saying that, you know, in one day I did all this and this was gradual. You know, it took time and I had a lot of good days and bad days. But little by little, the more I did these things consistently, 
the more my brain understood that, you know, I was okay and that there was nothing wrong with me to begin with because right. there really isn't anything wrong with us to begin with. Um, okay. So, that I mean, th those are the key points for me. Um, okay. With this, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> but I think what what you just described was there was a moment of clarity seeing mm -hmm. the information starting to really understand well what's this tms stuff and that kind of gave you a glimmer of hope like well maybe i'm not broken maybe there is something else going on yes and so that started to just by default start to lower the fear levels and as you got more and more into it and you started engaging in the community with christina and just the fear kept coming down and you started to explore expanding your capacity and doing more and you did it gradually, but yes. over a while, your brain eventually said, wow, look at Alexandra. She's ac actually doing normal stuff. So mm -hmm. she must be okay. And I would assume you also stopped pursuing medical treatments and got out of all those uh, very challenging support groups which in my opinion are wonderful, well-meaning people who are mm -hmm. terrified giving other people advice. And so taking advice from a terrified person who's in the worst of the worst, you know, uh, experience mm -hmm. is not a way for you to feel any safer. As a matter of fact, you just start feeling like, oh my goodness, is that my future? So getting out of those, um, I call them bad neighborhoods. But again, very clearly, they're wonderful people that are just not aware of this stuff yet. I agree a hundred percent. And um, I also feel like that with, with this work, you know, I, I, I discovered more about myself and I, I took it as an opportunity to like love myself more, give myself compassion. Um, you know, I realized that for years, all I was doing was trying to please everyone. Um, but myself, <laughs> So, you know, I, I started to set boundaries as well, you know, distance myself from people that I didn't align with and just ultimately cultivating a sense of safety in my body, which is crucial because if you don't feel safe, then you're not going to function. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Um, but so yeah, that's my story. <laughs> can I try to get a sense of the timeline because I can just anticipate some questions. So mm -hmm. from the time you found out about TMS, maybe watch that, uh, you know, a podcast on Nicole Sachs's podcast. Mm -hmm. um, from that point through when you said, oh my goodness, I'm actually feeling great. I'm, I'm better. How mm -hmm. long of a time frame was that? Any um, idea? Hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you are you asking like from the moment that I okay so from the moment that I started listening to the podcast to when I was like fully recovered or you're saying like from give me an idea of that journey uh, people always want to know well how long did it take her to get better you know yeah. so you know maybe how long until you started feeling somewhat better and then how long before you felt like okay I've got this beat okay I see what you're saying just, well the journey yeah I mean um at first I'd say that maybe it did take me a good like six months for me to start feeling like like consistently um without pain like at first it would be like one day yes one day no mm -hmm. uh, and then six months I'd say that like my brain fully understood were okay and you know I was living a normal life but I clearly got myself back into like this loop again um, I guess from like all the trauma and stress that I was exposed to with my kids um, and you know I, I got myself back into into that bad space and um, again I had to put put myself like I, I, I had to do this work again and just make sure that I felt safe in my body again. Right. And, and that took another, like another year, <laughs> but. So after, after you initially got better, you had a relapse. 
Um, did the relapse, um, did that surprise you and scare you and cause you to forget everything and start going back down the medical? Or did you say, I know what that is? Curious. Um, so with the vestibular stuff, I obviously like, I, I had no idea of, uh, of any of this. So that one I, doesn't count, but like with the pelvic stuff, I already had some minor knowledge, but I wouldn't say that I fully believed. Um, and when I got, you know, the, this the facial. Mouth, yeah, the facial pain, um, I, I was like, I'm not even going to go to the doctor because I already know where this is coming from. So, Good. yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to go down that route, rabbit hole again. So, um, and, and nothing. So, yeah. And so how are you feeling these days? I feel really, really great. Like I feel very aligned <laughs> with myself mm -hmm. and my body. And yes. So mm -hmm. I'm very, very grateful for her. <laughs> everything that I've learned, um, from your videos. And I still watch them. I even, I still watch them to be oh, honest. With you. They still I subscribe. So they still pop up on my, on my newsfeed all the time. So, oh, um, and I, I, you just bring the sense of calm and reassurance all the time. And it's just, that's all I need <laughs> a, a quick little video to remind me. Um, and yeah, I mean, for anyone watching this, you know, just don't give up. Um, don't believe everything your brain tells you. I promise you there's a way out. You're not alone and it, it is possible for you to be well. It is possible. Beautiful. I love yeah. that message of hope. Uh, <laughs> one thing I just wanted to point out, you mentioned brain fog and that you weren't able to remember things. Uh, mm -hmm. My interpretation of that is that we are in such a state of fear and survival, a survival mode mm -hmm. that we're not really listening to what's coming in, right? So somebody might tell you something and you're just in such a state of survival that like you're not paying attention and then you don't retain it. And then you feel crazy because I don't remember what they just told me. Um, I think it's more of that, that we're just so hyper-focused on what we're dealing with Yep. that the peripheral information is just, pushed aside and the brain goes that, That's is, so, important. that is so true because all of that I went know. away yeah all of that went away like it i i am it, things are very different now like i can fully concentrate on like a movie and i couldn't before like i couldn't sit down to just watch a movie and like sometimes people would talk to me and i would forget what they were saying you know five minutes later but like that's not the case anymore so it's like what happened like <laughs> I mean, is is your brain uh, suddenly fixed now? Like, I don't know. It's just, uh. Well, again, when you get out of survival mode and start to feel safer, mm -hmm. I believe the brain and the body goes back to balance and mm -hmm. normal function, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, just for the audience, it, this is all evidence that um, the perception of danger is what creates symptoms, but then we get wrapped up into the medical system, believing that we're broken. We're told we have this, this, that, or that diagnosis, and the fear gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and we get caught in that cycle for a long time. Now, fortunately, thank you, Google, for just showing Nicole's podcast to you, and you were probably at a point where you were at your wit's end and open to virtually anything, so you were like, all right, I'll listen to this. Um, and you were open-minded enough to go, well, maybe that makes sense to me. Here's another person, Whitney, by the way, I know her very well. Um, really? Oh, oh yeah. No, I, no. I know her very well. Um, <laughs> and yeah, she was a member of my group for a while. And she actually does some uh, graphic design for my Instagram. Cool. <laughs> so yeah, Whitney's a wonderful person. We've become friends over the years. So um, yeah, it's great. And I will make sure she knows that her success story on Nicole's podcast was what led you to diving into the whole TMS thing and that you're doing so much better. Um, I'm thrilled that not that you went through these things, but you've got a number of diagnoses that a lot of people struggle with and also struggle to accept that it's TMS or perceived danger pain, the, mm -hmm. dizziness, the brain fog, 
uh, pudendal neuralgia, there's a lot of success stories there. So that's not quite as much of a reach, but the burning mouth, I get people all the time, burning mouth, you have a burning mouth success story. How about trigeminal neuralgia? That one is a big one because people are so terrified of that. And in that community, everybody is scared to death, right? Yes. And so what you've proven is that the symptom doesn't matter. When the brain feels safer, all of these things have settled down. Exactly. It's all just evidence that your body really wasn't the problem. It was just essentially an overwhelmed, terrified brain that was raising these warning signals all over the place. Mm -hmm. Once you said, shh, we're okay, the brain said, oh, and things faded away. Mm -hmm. You're brilliant. The only encouragement I have for you is should you ever have more symptoms pop up as quickly as you can, I know what that is. Yes. I'm not mm -hmm. going to buy in with the fear. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to jump back into the swimming pool of fear and, and thrash around for a while. Recognize it for what it is. Call it out. And as quickly as you can, get calm, confident, clear, safe. I know I'm good. And oftentimes the recurrence of these things can go away before they even start. They never have to become chronic again. Yeah. So don't fear that. Um, recovery is when you recover from fear. Mm -hmm. Our bodies may sometimes still turn on a, a warning signal. Mm -hmm. But if you recognize it for what it is and don't really buy into the fear, they can be very short lived minutes, hours, days. And, you know, I'm 14 years chronic pain free. But I've probably had, you know, half a dozen to a dozen different episodes where I'll get some back pain. But because, I call, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, because I call it out for what it is, I don't fear it. I give it little to no concern. Mm -hmm. And then I get back to life. They're very short lived. Nothing has become chronic. Exactly. So beautiful. beautiful. Well, listen, I super, you know, appreciate you. Uh, unless you've got anything else you'd like to share, I think you did a wonderful job in telling your story. And I loved your message of hope at the end, which is you can do this. This is available to anybody watching this. Um, and, you know, you came from pretty dark depths of despair. Yeah. Just feeling like, holy crap, this is the rest of my life. And yep. so. Uh, you also mentioned, you know, feeling guilty for the help that you needed for anybody else who is feeling guilty because you do need help and you legitimately do um, try not to blame yourself. None of this was your fault, Alexander, none of it. It's just where you ended up. Right? Mm -hmm. And it was likely a result of your earlier childhood experiences and appendicitis being pulled away from your mom and going into the operating room by yourself and not your fault at all. None of this was your fault. It's just where you ended up. You ended up with a very uh, hypervigilant brain, always looking out for danger, and it led to these symptoms. And the beautiful part is you now have this knowledge for the rest of your life. Yeah. So you, you won't you so you won't end up here again. All right. And if there's a little twinge, you'll know exactly what it is and gonna be okay. Not gonna get into a panic because panic never really is the solution. So I'm Thank so you. proud of you. I'm so glad you decided to share your story. Uh, I hope the audience loves this. And uh, unless you've got anything else you wanted to say. No, I think we covered everything. Just thank you so much again. I'm so, so appreciative of all your videos. And I, I can't wait to help or chat with anyone that would like to reach out. You're yeah. more than welcome. Yeah, keep an eye on the Facebook community as well as the YouTube channel. It'll be okay. uh, posted in both locations. And okay. if you want to interact with people in the comments, feel free. Um, so again, thank you so okay. much. <laughs> All right. I appreciate you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.